immediately, almost immediately, my co-teachers, my timeless co-teachers, pushed me to um, teach certain parts of the lessons like phonics, um, which I was not really trained in, but they said, but you need to do it because you're the native speaker. Um, and they also suggested or expected that I would be teaching um, American cultural lessons on Christmas, Santa Claus, uh, American Thanksgiving. So I was a little bit confused um, after I finished this year, wondering why I was not given the opportunity to do something a little bit more authentic or a little bit away from the stereotype. Um, so I, I was considering this and when I went to the University of Edinburgh and I started my master's in applied linguistics and I started learning um, some of these different concepts, I kind of started to realize a little bit that maybe I felt that I had been given an unmerited position in the classroom um, and I was a little bit skeptical about this inherent power superiority of the native speaker. So today I'm going to walk through some of these concepts um, and uh, then present my, the findings of my study that I conducted. So to begin with some key concepts. Um, Teachers, uh, language teachers, are usually expected or even required to be native speakers, but what does this actually mean to be a native speaker? If there's a sense of being born with the language, of having somehow the language inside of you, and thereby a perfect competence in that language, um, that you embody the language, that you are walking around as an English speaker, you are English speaking. Um, there's also the sense that you are the only one able to own the language, um, and this idea or an illusion that everyone that is a native speaker speaks the standard form of that language. Um, so from uh, these ideas comes native speakerism. Um, in the ELT field, language teaching, English language teaching, um, native speaker teachers are preferred and idealized um, because of their language ability, but also because of some inherent teaching ability. So, we can also see language as capital, um, and this is uh, particularly true if you are a language teacher. So your accent, your pronunciation, um, if you sound like a native speaker, then um, you are not only more desirable by language learners, but therefore more hireable by uh, language schools and organizations, and so your capital goes up. Um, and this is a form of aesthetic labor. Uh, which says that looking good and sounding right um, gives you the most capital. And so, um, if you are a, also a white English speaker, as studies show that if you are white, um, your capital is even higher. Um, and so you sound, in ELT, if you look good, if you're white, and if you sound right, like a native speaker, then uh, you are at the top uh, for, for language speaker. Um, so this is our first key point, the idealization of the native speaker. So the native speaker becomes idealized for their entire package, that they look right and they sound right. They look good and they sound right. But um, sounding right is a function of our habitus, which is the deeply ingrained behaviors that we learn through our socialization, through our lived experiences. And the habitus that affects our speaking is the linguistic habitus. So that's how we physically produce language. Um, Basically, if you aren't a native speaker, if you are not born with the habitus, or you are not raised with the habitus of being a native speaker, um, you cannot sound native. You cannot sound like a native speaker. Um, and, um, however, um, the, what comes out of our mouth, naturally or natively, is not necessarily the standard. And actually, I would argue that it's the opposite of um, the standard, what comes natively out of our mouth. And this is the native speaker fallacy. The idea that what we think native speakers speak is not actually native speech, but a performed standard form of, of the speech. So actually when um, the idealization of native speaker speech is an idealization of something imaginary. Okay. So with these concepts, now we need some frameworks so that we can apply it to a language teaching concept, uh, context. The first um, framework that I am proposing is critical race theory, um, where we acknowledge race as a social construct, and it race has also been used as a tool of oppression. If we 
recognize race as a social construct, we can also uh, recognize language as a social construct. And in particular, this example of um, if a native speaker is just an idea and not a reality, as I just proposed, um, then there cannot be a native and non-native speaker dichotomy um, in reality. And so language becomes another tool of oppression. And Crump, in 2014, proposed a framework for this called Langcrit, um, where she analyzes how uh, language and, and, and race come together um, and um, affect how people negotiate their different identities, linguistic, racial identities. So we have a framework for language and race. Now we need one for teaching. Um, as I said before, um, habitus is your, the reproduction of your um, physically embraced behaviors learned through your socialization. And the education system arbitrarily privileges a certain habitus. So this is usually of a certain class, um, including linguistic norms. Okay, and all of this, uh, it affects um, your students or your children's identity formation. Um, the um, institution, the educational institution, trains teachers to embody a particular habitus, a particular standard that they push onto their students, maybe not intentionally, but also maybe intentionally. So we can use um, the framework identity as pedagogy, which also was mentioned yesterday, um, where teachers can use their diverse identities, linguistic, racial, class, etc., cetera, um, and they can um, try to combat or at least negotiate these arbitrary ideals that are in place. And in the field of ELT, um, teachers can use their particularly linguistic um, identities to combat or deconstruct the idea of the ideal native speaker. So we have our concepts, these frameworks. Now I think we're ready for the questions of today. How do English teachers abroad negotiate their diverse identities against linguistic and cultural expectations of a native speaker? And do programs that send English teachers abroad perpetuate or deconstruct the native speaker ideal? So to answer these questions, um, I did a study under the Fulbright program, which is a United States um, Department of State Department program uh, all over the world, and with the motto of a little more knowledge, a little less conflict. So through research, study, teaching, um, they hope to create a more cooperative, more peaceful world. Um, and one of these opportunities is the English Teaching Assistantship Award. The country chosen for this study was Taiwan. Um, and the particular site was Taidong County, which is in the south, uh, southeast coast. And okay, that's me because I chose this site because I um, served as an English Teaching Assistant, ETA, there. So I had access to the staff, the current uh, teaching assistants, and the local Taiwanese um, the analysis was named using grounded theory, so as I collected more data from uh, interviews, blogs, etc., um, different themes, common themes, um, started to emerge and that allowed me to um, develop different theories. Um, and this started with a pre preliminary analysis of um, teaching assistance blogs um, about five months before the present study, um, where different themes like native speakerism, uh, race idealization in language teaching, started coming out, and so that was the starting point for the analysis of the subsequent data, which came from other ETA blogs, um, the Fulbright ETA website and handbook, ETA interviews, and interviews with the local Taiwanese English teachers. So here are the 11 um, American English teaching assistants um, that I interviewed, um, and I included, you will see also their self-declared race and field of study um, in case it happened to be uh, relevant to their perception of their job, and hint, hint, it was. Um, so I will now walk through some of the themes that emerged, um, in particularly the interviews, because those were the most um, hardy, uh, that was the most hardy material that I got. And so defining the native speaker. One common theme that emerged, especially from the interviews, um, was that it was hard to define what is a native speaker. So even though these English teaching assistants had applied for this, uh, this grant, this award, based on identifying as a native English speaker, 
and they were accepted because they were, in theory, a native English speaker, um, they couldn't actually definitively say what a, a native speaker was. They said, okay, you can be a native speaker of more than one language, um, maybe it's a matter of proficiency, so even if you learn it later, but it's your most comfortable one, maybe that makes you a native speaker. It's the first language you learn, a bunch of different ideas from all of the interviewees. They could not definitively say, but I would argue actually that this is a positive thing um, because if we're trying to combat the idea of an ideal native speaker, not having a defined picture of what a native speaker is, is really helpful. Um, and so it adds, it broadens the picture of what it can be. If you can be a native speaker with multiple native languages um, or different proficiencies, then we're adding nuance to what native speaker can mean, which will help deconstruct this idea of an ideal native speaker. A second theme that emerged was um, the discussion of embodying true English. Um, so here are some comments by the ETAs. They said things like, um, we embody the purpose of, of teaching English. We embody why kids should care. Um, we embody a native command of the language. Um, we show that there's people actually outside the textbook. So we are a physical representation of an English speaker. We are a walking, talking America, so not only English, but we physically embody American culture as well. And we are a go-to person to ask for English questions. So um, these kinds of comments um, uh, were, were particularly interesting um, because it reaffirms this idea that somehow the native speaker is inherently superior. So despite um, training and uh, qualifications, years of experience, the only ones that actually qualify to do this particular job of embodying English and, and culture and, and so forth um, is if you have the habitus of being a native speaker, if you can physically embody the language. Um, so this obviously um, kind of puts aside the non-native speaker teachers saying you can never serve this, this role. But um, this was only really true in this study um, for non-East Asian looking ETAs. Um, as an Asian American being foreign, it's a different situation as one. Um, and I have to work really hard to maintain the foreigner perception if I'm Chinese American. So this was also really interesting because um, if it's not obvious that they embody the language and the ability to be a native speaker teacher, um, then they really have to work hard to prove their value which was not the case for the ones fitting the stereotype, the ideal. Um, many ETAs also believed that they were the guardians of nuance of the English language, um, and they made different comments that suggest that they positioned themselves as a linguistic authority. So here are a couple comments again. Um, MH describes uh, native speech as normal. She says they have no concept of what sounds normal, saying that native speech is normal, thereby positioning non-native speech as abnormal. Um, but again, she's not a trained, she's not a trained teacher. Um, this is just a, an American who went abroad for this program. And then LG um, presented a list of names of her students, their English names, and she said that some of them were good, but a lot of them were not good. A lot of them were laughable names. Um, she provided a list of names including uh, Rock, Elmo, and Apple. Um, but actually, maybe some of you know that there are real people, celebrities, that have these names. Um, and so she's conflating her personal experience um, and her position as a native speaker with the, with the ability to be an authority on naming conventions. But um, actually, she, it's just her personal experience and her own view. Um, most of the ETAs also said that pronunciation, so in addition to what's sounding normal or, or possibly native, that also pronunciation was one of the most important aspects of their job. Um, and saying things like, as a native speaker, you model correct language. So again, putting native speech with the idea of correct or standard. Um, and most of the only, it was a small uh, sample of local Taiwanese teachers, but most of them directly referenced that ETAs have accurate language and that they are like the voice from a CD player or from the movies or from CNN. Um, so this positions the ETA as an embodiment of, of English again, 
um, and positions them as authorities on what's standard and what's correct. In addition, race emerged as, um, as a topic for many of the ETAs, um, and race apparently affected their perception of their role. Um, many of the white ETAs said, I have the privilege of not having to prove myself as an English teacher. Um, and even going so far as to say, this is my privilege that is um, that only a select few are born with, so it is my duty. Not only is it my, my privilege, but it is my duty to teach. Yeah, I also laugh, but <laughs> um, it's my duty to teach those who were not given this privilege in their life. Um, and so they have, they show a conflation of their status as a white English speaker, native English speaker, they conflate that with their ability um, and duty even to teach English. But they also conflate not only their own um, duty or job, but also the pronunciation of their Taiwanese teaching partner with their teaching ability in the classroom. So they made comments like, as far as teaching English goes, she's very competent. She's very qualified for her job and she does a great job. But again, I remind you that these are not qualified teachers. Um, they might not have any teaching experience or, or English experience. Um, and so I don't necessarily believe that they're qualified to make this kind of assessment. This assessment is coming based on the um, evaluation of the pronunciation. So this basically is saying her English is really good, so she's a good teacher. But again, this was mostly true. This conflation happened most often in um, white ETAs because um, there was a, one ETA who identified as Chinese American and he made the opposite point that people who had to learn the language are actually better and more realistic language role models for, for the students. Um, and this is um, interesting because um, it shows the difference in perception of the role between someone who fits the ideal native speaker and someone who doesn't. He says that teaching ability is not necessarily linked to your um, native speaker status. Finally, the final theme that emerged, well, one of the final ones um, that I will present today is um, the purpose of the um, English Teaching Assistantship Award. So the majority of the ETA said that um, actually the cultural exchange was more important than teaching English. Um, they said, our main purpose here is to be a cultural ambassador. And some even said that in the trainings, um, the program, the, the trainers, were telling them how, as native speakers, they're here to help the local system get better. They're here to help um, give new methodology and new ideas to the local teachers. But um, here, a uh, cultural exchange appears to be or an imposition of American teaching methods and culture on the Taiwanese system. Um, so there's a conflation uh, in maybe this, the Fulbright program itself, um, where native speakers and is at play. So they're conflating uh, native speaker status with uh, the inherent, inherent teaching ability. So even the program itself is positioning the ETAs in this way. So. To draw some uh, conclusions and to answer our questions, our key questions from before. It appears um, from this study, although more work should be done on this, that um, race did affect how um, ETAs perceived their job and the different experiences that they had were affected by their race. So white um, ETAs in particular, but also black, um, were more easily accepted as native speakers based on their physical characteristics. Um, and so um, they were more accepted, more easily accepted as English teachers as well. Um, and since they didn't have to combat against this ideal, they were more likely to assume that position and take on the responsibility and make comments like, it is my job to teach pronunciation or I am the native speaker and so I am here to do this. In contrast, um, Asian American ETAs were a bit more critical um, of their role. They were more um, cautious in uh, assuming the native speaker role, probably because they had to think about it more often on actually a conscious level. Um, and they spoke more often about um, 
that maybe it's wrong to impose teaching methods also, or to assume that because I'm a native speaker, I can teach better. Um, so to answer the question, does Fulbright's PTA program and programs similar um, perpetuate or challenge the native speaker ideal? Well, as I said, um, they did, some of the ETAs did mention that um, their trainings um, position them as all-knowing native speakers um, that could come and improve uh, the teaching methods, offer something different. And so even before they begin their job, their time there, they're trained by the program to believe that they are somehow inherently superior. Um, so they go into the classroom, and the local teachers, also believing in this ideal, um, push all of the authority onto them, and they end up taking on that position of authority. Um, one ETA did point out that the structure of the program could be actually very benefic uh, beneficial in um, deconstructing the native speaker ideal, because every year a new ETA should go into the schools, um, which would provide, you know, after a series of years, it would provide um, exposure to different kinds of Americans, different kinds of English, and so this could help deconstruct the native speaker ideal. Okay, this is um, in theory because in practice, not every school gets a new ETA every year and sometimes they have it once and then never again. So it's a, possibly a, um, a good step um, of the program, but again, we have to see how it's actually carried out. So to conclude, in general, um, although ETAs are enticing, they're an enticing way to build international relations, as um, Fulbright aims to do. Um, it's risky to place untrained teachers who are not aware of their um, influence in the classroom into this position of authority. Um, some ETAs mentioned that maybe the selection process could, um, if they change the selection process, it could help combat this ideal um, in a stronger way, because if you are a committed teacher, if you are a passionate educator, then maybe you're more willing to um, reflect on your own identities and how you can use them in the classroom to break down these um, oppressive systems. So we could grant, uh, limit the grant to passionate educators. Um, but in general, the findings do demonstrate the need for a more critical engagement with the assumptions that underlie native speakerism in programs for teaching English abroad. So, um, Teachers and scholars, if we consider these questions um, more consciously, then we can change the figurative and literal face of English language teaching. Um, so I have a couple, if I still have some time, I'm up over time. So if you want to know something about um, suggestions for how we could change the program or the limitations of the study, then you can ask.